Thank you, Sharon, so much. As we uh, get ready to confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed, I think it's so appropriate to just remember, you know, when, the, when these creeds were written, this is what they would go back to. The, the Bible wasn't readily available on everybody's phones like it is now. And this would just be, people would gather around this and make their declaration of their doctrinal beliefs uh, and, and say it together. And there was so much power when they declared what they believed together. And we echo that thou, <laughs> hundreds and thousands of years later that uh, this is still what we believe today. Will you join me? We believe in one God, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, He worships and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. We can go ahead and invite all the, the kids to come on up and have a seat in the front. I love all the kids, having them in here. Bring all the kids, pack this place out with children. Um, thank you to all you parents and aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas and neighbors and everybody who went through everything to get your kids ready and get them to church. It is uh, so important that our, our kids feel comfortable in the house of the Lord and feel comfortable around the people of God. So thank you guys very much for all your efforts to do that. And hey guys. And after the service, I do have suckers for the kids. If, if they, get, they have to have permission from their people. Wait. No. Can you take that Thank you. 
Okay. What are you holding? Okay. So what do we call today? Palm Sunday. Do you know why? Because we have palms. Because we have palms. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Do you know why we celebrate with palms? They are a symbol of victory to the Jewish people. The palm trees grow 80 feet tall. Like 80 feet tall, the palm trees that these come off of. It would be like six of our churches uh, stacked on each other. Yeah. Um, the feathery light branches, or fronds, uh, that you're holding, grow six to eight feet. Now, ours have been cut down for convenience. Now, bending down from the top of the trees. They grow best near the site of Jericho. Do you remember what happened in Jericho? And? He came in on a donkey. Not at Jericho. That's Jericho. The walls came down. Speak up. It's true. Yeah. The walls came tumbling down, and that was Joshua, okay, who was Jewish. Okay. Now, why do you think that, okay, when Jesus came in, they waved their palms. What did the people do next? They set them down so your donkey could walk on them. Their cloaks. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you need coats. Do you know why they did that? Uh, uh, um, in ancient Israel, when there was a conquering hero or God, they would welcome welcome them with their cloaks as a sign of respect. Um, and they also did this for Jesus. Now they shouted Hosanna. We just sang Hosanna. Do you know what Hosanna means? Okay. Um, Hosanna means save us, please. So when Jesus was coming in and he was honored with the cloaks and the palms, and the Israel people shouted Hosanna in the highest, they were actually pleading with him to save them. Jesus expected, excuse me, the people expected Jesus to save them from the Romans who had conquered and were controlling them. Okay, Jesus came in on a colt. What is a colt? You want mine? Can Mama have, can she have mine? <coughs> Kings rode horses when they entered the city. However, Jesus came riding, riding in on a colt, a young donkey. The reason why he did this instead of a horse, horses were beasts of war. He came as a prince of peace to fulfill the Old Testament. This was the exact opposite of what the Jewish people wanted. Next week is called Holy Week. Do you know why? Okay. Several things happened this week. The people turned on Jesus because they thought he would come in as a conquering <laughs> hero and destroy the Romans. What he is is a prince of peace. That means more it's, it's your, your spirit, your love, your caring. Um, it, it was a challenge for Jesus to get there. He came from Jericho. Jericho is down further south. He went through rocky, ro you know, difficult roads, but he rode there because he knew what was going to be happening on Easter Sunday. Let us pray. <coughs> Jesus, you pass all these trials in perfect obedience to the Father. Why? Because we are precious to you. May we give you all the love you deserve and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And we have a picture for you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You'll notice they're not they're not holding bombs, they're holding they're holding these, but they should be palm bombs. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, as the kids, thank you, Judy and Mary, as the kids go back to their seats, I want to just uh, remind us of a few things. Uh, next week will be Resurrection Sunday.
we will have, uh, we're asking all the men to bring cinnamon rolls, okay? With lots of frosting, I have a note, extra frosting. So, cinnamon rolls, guys, cinnamon rolls with extra frosting. And I'll, I'll go through all of the of Holy Week's activities at the, at the end of service. But just a couple things to remind us about. Um, we've kind of extended this the table out in the narthex that have all the sign-up sheets. And thank you to every all the ladies who worked really hard to make that happen. Uh, we All the information of what's going on in the church you can find right out there at that table. Um, and you can sign up as you need to uh, for the different events that we have going on. Uh, just a reminder of a few things. There is a women's breakfast that's happening uh, the first week in April. I want to say it's the 6th or 7th. I can't remember. First Saturday in... It's the 6th. The 6th of April, you can sign up right out there in the narthex. Um, every week at, or every Wednesday at noon, I always open my office up for prayer. If you're available or you're in the area and you want to come out and pray for a half an hour, um, please come and join me for prayer. That's every Wednesday at noon. Um, I also have, uh, the. it'll be the Monday after Easter, our Happening Now Zoom small group where we just kind of look at some of the legislation and some of the things that are going on in our world and in our culture and how we respond as believers to some of these things, you can sign up for that out there as well. And I want to now invite Miss May Mullen to come up. She's going to uh, represent our confirmation students and she is going to read the gospel which we are going to be looking at today. The gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethage, to the Mount Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the full of beasts of burn. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on their clothes, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their clothes on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the Crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Very good. Thank you, May. Don't you appreciate these young people stepping out of their comfort zones? It's, it's, it's hard enough to come up, you know, for a young person in front of their peers and speak, but to, to come up and stand in front of an entire church congregation can be uh, rather intimidating. So I've appreciated so much their uh, efforts because they go home and they, re they rehearse all these uh, scriptures a week or two weeks before they come up and, and, and share. And I just, uh, I think it's such a, an opportunity for them to grow in the boldness and the expression of of their faith. We're going to talk out of that same scripture this morning, but before we do, I want to embarrass uh, two young ladies in this room today. Uh, one, two, both of them were in my youth ministry years ago, and they read a, a verse in the Bible that said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And they thought that that meant them too, so they are going out into all the world and preaching the gospel. Claire McAllister, if you can just kind of raise your hand, she just got back from Japan and she was on missions over there with Youth with a Mission. Many of you have heard of that organization. And then I also want to introduce Michaela Jones, who's getting ready, in fact, to leave to go down to Mexico to preach the gospel to all nations and baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So do yourself a favor. Uh, go up, introduce yourself to them, encourage them as they get ready to leave home and uh, go to foreign missions and... Uh, Spread the good news of Jesus. So, we're going to be looking, yeah. What's that? Oh, no. No, no, no. Well, yes, but no. 
Uh, anyway, so we're going to be looking at the same passage that May just read. Um, and just a couple of things to keep in mind as, as we go through this passage here. Now, this was the time of Passover. So people were flooding into the city of Jerusalem. And that it would probably add, a lot of historians would say it would add 400 to 700,000 people in this city. Imagine how many people are there to celebrate the Passover. And because of that, there would be a massive military presence in the city. And in the previous chapter, we see the events that led up to the triumphal entry. Jesus prophesied one last time about his death to his 12 disciples on the road approaching Jerusalem. Jesus had just healed two blind men, and they joined the crowd with him and his disciples. And if you were here on Thursday, you heard a little bit about the story of Zacchaeus and all that took place as they were getting ready to set up this triumphal entry. Now, Beth Page, you'll look down if you have your sermon uh, companion, you will see a little map there, and that kind of gives us an idea of where Jesus had to travel. Uh, if you don't, just kind of peer over and look at your neighbors. But you can see over to the east, you can see Jericho where they're coming through. They're getting to Bethany now, and now into Bethpage, where we pick up our story. And that's at the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. Jesus and his disciples would have to summit the Mount of Olives from the east and walk down the west side of the mountain into the city of Jerusalem. And once they would... Uh, enter into the city of Jerusalem, they'd enter in through the temple gate, right into the temple courts. Now, as they approach Bethpage, Jesus tells two of his disciples to go ahead into the village and to untie a mother donkey and her colt there. And then he instructs them with a message to give anyone who asks them what they're doing. He says, tell them this, the Lord needs them. That was the simple instruction, the Lord needs them. And this is where the story just, it gets fascinating right out of the gate. Now these instructions the disciples were given were very specific instructions. Because Jesus was about to make a proclamation about who he has been, who he is now, and who he will always be. See, Jesus is the one putting this event into motion. And by putting this event into motion, he is setting up each event that will come after it over the next week. And we've got to understand there's a divine strategy behind all of this. He's, he alone is choosing the time of Passover. He is choosing the Mount of Olives to make his descent into the city. He's choosing the city of Jerusalem, and he is choosing a cult. By doing these things, he is an unveiling an opportunity for the people who are following him to make a choice. Believe Jesus who is who he says he is, or believe Jesus is who they say he is. That seems to be the question that is echoing through culture. Who is Jesus? We all battle with this at times, if we're honest. We want Jesus to fit into our mold, our ideology, our preference. And that's kind of what Lent has been about, has been about being honest with ourselves. But see, Jesus is declaring through this prophesied event, and there was over 300 messianic prophecies, that God and God alone will define who Jesus is. The government of that day and the government of today does not define who Jesus is. Hollywood does not define who Jesus is. Fox News and CNN definitely do not define who Jesus is. Not even the great Billy Graham defines who Jesus is. Martin Luther doesn't define who Jesus is. Definitely Pastor Eric does not define who Jesus is. Jesus and Jesus alone defines who he is, and he proves it through this event today. Jesus has set into motion the sequence of events that will not only alter the course of human history, but will unveil the path and accessibility into eternal life. Jesus is establishing who he is for the world to see. He's more than a carpenter. He's more than a teacher. He's more than a rabbi. He's more than a political critic. He's more than a miracle worker. He is the one and only Messiah and final fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies and the law. 
Zechariah 9.9 says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This verse is one of so many hundreds of messianic prophecies. And just a few that are listed in the book of Zechariah specifically. With this one pertaining to this event we're talking about today. Prophecy indicates what he is bringing spiritually and indicates this, the vehicle in which he will bring it. He will offer spiritual salvation to all and present himself as sovereign king over all. He does this in the most humble way possible by riding in on a colt, the baby of a donkey. In our text, Matthew, the, the donkey is called a beast of burden. The, don the, the donkey was used then and is still used today to carry burdens such as supplies and heavy objects of the owner. They're used during the harvest to pull carts and carry loads. These people in Bethpage would understand this as they are working class people working in the fields outside of the city. Now, the beast of burden comes from a Greek, Greek word, hoop ad zug ia, which means under the yoke. Jesus is proclaiming himself king, and through a very humble statement, is inviting us all into his righteous yoke. He said earlier in Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The triumphal entry is an invitation to be a permanent citizen of a new kingdom, subjects of a new government, and a relationship with a new and righteous king. Jesus was making a sovereign proclamation through a humble display. Jesus was setting the standard of humility in his sovereign reign as king. Now there is a difference between what Jesus is proclaiming and what some people are expecting. When Jesus had his disciples bring him a colt, he was practicing what is known as angaria. And this is a, a political uh, act where a major political or religious figure could request livestock to fulfill their duties at hand. In other words, he was commandeering this donkey, to use a modern-day phrase. And this would cause confusion to some people if they did not fully understand who Jesus was, and what the prophecy said about him. And we need to remember, of course, that Jerusalem and the nation of Israel was under Roman oppression. The people were desperate for a leader to rise to free them from the tyranny of the Romans, the taxes and, and the restrictions and, and, and the religious persecution. Now, the religious leaders of the day, and mainly the Sanhedrin, had been the supporters of Roman rule as it emboldened their religious power. Many of the people were looking for freedom from the political tyranny of the Roman rule, but Jesus was offering freedom from the spiritual tyranny of sin. And this is what makes the triumphal entry so fascinating, so complex. Jesus is making a political statement spiritual. You see, like you all know, we're, we're in an election cycle this year. And if you're anything like me, maybe you have some preferences or you have some opinions about some of the things. Our nation right now is under spiritual oppression. But guess what? There is no political leader that is going to solve our moral dilemma. It's not going to be Joe Biden. It's not going to be Donald Trump. Only Jesus offers the freedom and healing from oppression that we so desperately need. Amen. In 2 Kings chapter 9, during the reign of King Ahab, who was a, a, a tyrannical king that was controlled by a manipulative queen named Jezebel, Elisha gives the prophetic orders for a man named Jehu to be anointed king of Israel while Ahab is still on the throne. As Jehab as Jehu, excuse me, is anointed king of Israel in secret, in a secret meeting, it is prophesied that Jehu will overthrow Ahab 
and Jezebel will meet her justified demise. When Jehu emerged from the secret meeting with the prophet, it was announced that he would be king of Israel, and people began to lay their cloaks down in front of him as the new prophesied and anointed king made his way from the secret meeting. 2 Kings 9.13 says, Then every man in haste took his garment and put it under him on bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. This same excitement is welling up in the hearts of the people of Bethpage and now into the city of Jerusalem. They began to throw down their cloaks as a symbol of submission. In those days, the cloaks were a major part of their lives. Their cloak was protection from the weather. It helped store items on a journey. And in the case of Elijah and Elisha, the cloak represented the mantle, a prophetic office that Elijah passed down to his predecessor. In so many ways, throwing down their cloaks was a way of surrendering fully to who Jesus was proclaiming that he was. That they would lay down their lives for Jesus and follow him unconditionally. But of course, we know that would change in a few short days. Now the palm branches that we all have in here today were a symbol of victory. When armies would come back from battle, they would wave these palm branches They would have ticker ticker tape parades of the day and wave these palm branches and throw them on the ground in front of their victorious heroes. The king would be leading the procession on a beautifully bred giant horse or many times on an elephant to symbolize his strength and victory. The people would wave the branches as appreciation and admiration for what he had accomplished. Now the people were making a public declaration of their allegiance to King Jesus today in the same way. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing, and he knew what a public declaration like this would mean for him and those who followed him. But Jesus was bound by the truth, and he had to unapologetically declare that he was King of Kings, and he was Lord of Lords. Jesus was setting an eternal standard of kingship and royalty. He enters the city great to great celebration, to great applause, to palm branches, to cloaks. The people are excited about who he is, and they believe him so much that they are publicly declaring their allegiance to him. They're cheering and they're singing in celebration. Psalms 118, 25 through 26 says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. This was their cry for liberation. Now this was one of the last Hallel songs sung at Passover. And Hosanna was a Greek word, we know, derived from a Hebrew word, Hoshana. And it means, O save, or save now. This is where the narrative of Holy Week begins. The whole city was stirred up to this event. This was different than any other event regarding Jesus to this point. Before this, Jesus had not told people who he was. And he asked people not to declare who he was, even if they had figured it out. And now we understand why. Because he wanted to be the one to make the proclamation in his time, in his location, and in his method. The final verse in this passage out of Matthew simply says this. This is what the crowd is saying. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth. Now Nazareth, we need to understand this, had been a hotbed for revolutionary thought, for anti-government ideas. Anyone who had plotted an attempted insurrection or an overthrow of the government was most likely from Nazareth. This could have been interpreted to indicate to the government officials or to the Sanhedrin that Jesus was actually attempting to overthrow the Roman rule and rally people to his cause. Many rebels from Nazareth had been arrested, tried, and even crucified before Jesus. If one didn't understand the messianic prophecies, and they were focused on the tyranny at hand, they would believe that Jesus was just another insurrectionist sparking a rebellion. And this is what so many people were expecting They had been waiting for a political Messiah to come to set them free from Roman rule 
and tyranny. But Jesus was coming to set them free from sin's rule and sin's tyranny. Jesus knew in order to do this, he would have to make a bold and true statement about who he was. He was starting a rebellion against sinful culture back then and is still leading that rebellion today. And it is a righteous rebellion. Now what Jesus is doing is very dangerous. He is in so many ways challenging the loyalty of the people who are subjected to the Roman rule. He is allowing them to publicly claim their allegiance to him and publicly reject their allegiance to the religious and political leaders. This would be very dangerous for anyone who made such a proclamation. What would happen to them as a result? Arrest, possibly execution. And as they they threw down their palm branches and they threw down their coats and made this public declaration, it would be those same people who in just a few short days would join with the other crowds chanting, Crucify him, crucify him. But there was a small remnant that stayed true to their public display that day. And it continues, and we're a part of it. They would continue to wave their spiritual palm branches and lay down their lives for him each day. The challenge of Palm Sunday is very simple. Do we trust in Jesus' kingship? Do we trust his righteous agenda? Do we trust that he will show himself victorious over sin's tyranny? Do we believe he is who he says he is? Palm Sunday sets a standard of belief for many victories to come. And one of those great victories to come is Jesus will begin, began, remember, that triumphal entry on the Mount of Olives. And the same place that is prophesied in Zechariah 14, he will, oh, he, will, he will return one day to the earth and he will appear on the Mount of Olives. He will then overthrow the secular government and set up a righteous kingdom here on earth for 1,000 years. He will then eliminate once and for all any influence or earthly power that Satan has. We will then be ushered into a new heaven and a new earth according to Revelations 21 to be with our victorious and triumphant king for all eternity. But this hope would not be possible without the events that are going to take place this holy week. Let's allow this week to lead us, to guide us over these next few days. Let's allow the story of Scripture to shape our hearts as we prepare to celebrate Resurrection Sunday and to celebrate that our God is a God who says, who does what He says He is going to do. Amen. And with that in, in our hearts, let's, let's continue to consider our mission. And we have a mission here to reach the Graham community, to reach the Pierce County community, to reach this area and the places that God has given us reach and favor into. And we do that by sowing and being obedient with our finances to further the cause of Christ in this community. So let's pray over this offering. Lord, I thank you, God, for the faithfulness of this house. Lord, this is a faithful house. Lord, this is a house that is obedient. Lord, and I pray that you, we would see the fruit of our obedience. We would see the fruit of our finances, God, in the kingdom and in the souls that we reach, God. I thank you, Lord, for the, the bridges of favor you're building with different community members and different community places, God. And I pray that reach would grow more and more as we can be trusted more and more, God. We give you this offering. Multiply it for the furthering of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
I, I love the words of that song that the psalmist wrote, Create in me a clean heart. We can't make our hearts clean. We can't make our hearts clean. But this is what communion is all about. It's about surrendering our brokenness to Jesus and allowing Him to make us whole. Allowing Him to make us clean. Allowing His presence to invade every area of our life to make us worthy. Not because of us, because of Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 22 says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, oh, my page turned, and now I have ransom. Can you come up here and turn the page? There we go. I was going to try and blow it, but I didn't want to blow on the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This body represents, this, this is his body. He's inviting us to partake in his body. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. His is the only sacrifice necessary for the atonement of our sins. Not my sacrifice or your sacrifice or the sacrifice of somebody else. His and his alone atones our sins. And a few notes as we uh, get ready to celebrate communion. If you would, in, a, in, a, in an act of prophetic ce- ce- uh, celebration, bring your palm branches and, and throw them right down here at the altar. In, 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 not right now, I mean in an orderly fashion. Uh, <laughs> as, you, as you partake in communion, and throw them down as we celebrate the victory that communion reminds us about. And the victory that Jesus is who he says he is. And then for those of you I know that are, that are visiting and guests here today, we're so thrilled that you're here. Um, just to note, the, the, the juice is white and the wine is red, and, and choose whatever you would, you would prefer um, as you celebrate communion. We're so thrilled you're here. And the table has been set, and we're ready to go. And you guys can be seated as we do this.
Sorry. Nothing more.
get ready to close this morning, just a few things that I want us to continue to uh, lift up in prayer. Always the nation of Israel. Um, we know they're not innocent. They never have been. Um, but the Lord instructs us to pray for the nation of Israel. And uh, what's being said, and we're, see- we're seeing it all over the place, the anti-Semitism and the, the, the hatred towards God's people, it's always been like that. And we need to continue to pray for the nation of Israel, especially their leaders, that they'll repent and that their leaders will, will turn to the Lord. We remember that that nation, that land, is, is, was chosen by God. And we read that throughout <coughs> Scripture. We need to, uh, especially, we need to pray for the state of Washington and especially the parents of the state of Washington as, as we're seeing come down. Uh, a lot of things that are going to be uh, anti-God, anti-family uh, curriculums that will be taught in our schools starting next year. Um, a lot of parents are going to have to make some decisions, some tough ones, and uh, we want to pray for them. We, you know, we live in a, a culture that is anti-God and we can't expect anything uh, less than that, really, from from our culture. But uh, as people of God, we ha- we still have to navigate. We need wisdom in order to do that. And as always, pray for our military, pray for our military leaders, uh, pray for our nation, um, pray for our, the politicians who are making laws and decisions, especially with our tax dollars. Um, whether we agree with them or not, we we must pray for them. Um, And then uh, give thanks for Ron Heilman's and his uh, recovery, that he'll continue to recover, and many of our friends and family that are part of this church are recovering as well. So will you go to the Lord in prayer with me? Father God, we lift up all these requests to you. We know that you are a God that hears our prayers. You hear our hearts, God. You know our needs before we even ask them. And this is a room full of, of, of people, and we all have needs. We all have requests. We all have struggles. We all have things that we need to, to bring before you, and whether they're spoken or unspoken, you know them. And we're so grateful for that, God. We lift up our nation, uh, this nation of America. We desperately need Jesus. We need, we need Jesus. We need a triumphal entry of Jesus coming into this nation and proclaiming that he is who he says he is. I pray that you would strengthen the church, that, that the true church, that worship Jesus and stands on, uh, on the scripture without compromise. Strengthen us, God, for this coming season in our nation that we will, without compromise, proclaim the truth of your word with our lives and from our pulpits and uh, through our community, Lord. We pray for the nation of Israel, Lord, that you would protect that nation, protect that land, and that the, the, the Jewish people will realize that you are the one true Messiah and that you came to forgive their sins, and and reconcile their relationship with you. And God, we lift up uh, our community, uh, the Bethel School District. We lift up Kapowson Elementary School right next door. Lord, that, that you would strengthen the Christians that serve in those schools and serve in those uh, community uh, positions, Lord, that you would give us not just this church, but all the churches in the area, Lord, uh, favor with those schools that we can serve them and, and be the, the light of Jesus Christ in some of those dark places, God. And I thank you, Lord, for those who are recovering from surgeries and recovering from sickness and ailments. Continue to bring about your miracle working power in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And now may the Lord bless you, and may he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you, and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
stand for our final hymn. reminders about what's coming up this week. This Wednesday uh, at 6 p.m. we are going to have a Seder dinner right here with a good friend of mine, Pastor Brett Emery. If you've ever been to a Passover Seder dinner, it's a beautiful time to really allow the Passover and scriptures to come to life. Then on uh, Maundy Thursday and uh, Good Friday at 7 p.m., note Know the times, uh, especially 7 p.m. We're going to be having services right here as we really study the crucifixion and uh, prepare our hearts for uh, Resurrection Sunday. Then, on Sunday morning, we have our normal 9.30 Resurrection Sunday service, but we are also having a 6.30 sunrise service. And we are praying for a clear morning because you look right outside that door and you see some of the sunrises and the purples and the red and the yellow it is a beautiful beautiful thing so just note all the different times of all the events that we have thank you all for coming and just a reminder we saw these two candles being extinguished this one representing the humanity of jesus this one representing the deity of jesus and because of jesus's humanity we can experience his deity and when they're extinguished the light We've got to remember the light is inside of all of us. And we take it out to a dark, dark world that desperately needs some good news. So now go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.